about this, even though it is a prokaryote, the mechanics, how DNA replication occurs, are pretty much the same in prokaryotes and in eukaryotes. And much of what we know about replication, uh, we learn by studying E. coli. Now recall that DNA is a double-stranded molecule. In E. coli, there is only one origin of replication. Even, there are many origins of replication in eukaryotes. In E. coli, there is one origin of replication, and it is called the Ori C. And it is a small sequence of nucleotides. Okay. At the origin of replication, initiator proteins are going to bind to this. Now, this binding of the initiator proteins is going to cause a localized unwinding. And it is this localized unwinding that is going to begin the replication process. This localized unwinding is going to allow for the protein helicase to bind. Okay? Now this is very important. Helicase alone cannot begin unwinding process. It is the initiator proteins binding to the origin of replication that allows for that bubble to open so that helicase and single-stranded binding proteins can come in. After the bubble has opened up, at each end, several things are happening. Single-stranded binding proteins have now bind because the helicase has opened the bubble up. Helicase works by breaking the hydrogen bonds between bases. Now these bases want to come back together and reform those hydrogen bonds. And this is where the single-stranded binding proteins come in. Uh, until the actual replication begins, all of these bases want to form. So at this initial bubble, you will actually find these single-stranded binding proteins actually surrounding the entire bubble. We just have them here for illustrative purposes. The helicases have actually bound to the lagging strand template. Now we have illustrated which are the three prime and five prime ends of each of the strands of DNA. But students often have difficulty understanding what we mean by leading strand and lagging strand. And in order to illustrate this, we have another prop to show this much more clearly in linear DNA. In this short piece of DNA, we can be reminded about some very important things about the DNA polymerases in E. coli. The first thing is that polymerases in E. coli, DNA polymerases, cannot start de novo. What do we mean by that? It means that DNA polymerase cannot initiate replication by themselves. They have to add on to an existing piece of nucleotide. All right? And because they can't initiate by themselves, they need help. And they get the help by adding on to a piece of RNA because RNA polymerases can start by themselves. They can initiate replication de novo. So RNA polymerases will bind to DNA, and this is RNA polymerase. Okay, so the primase has laid down the primers. The primers are between 10 and 12 base pairs long. And the important thing to note here is that the primers have been laid down in an anti-parallel fashion. So this DNA strand goes from 5' prime to 3'. Prime, and the primer has been laid down 5' prime to 3'' prime anti-parallel. On this DNA strand, which has gone from 5' prime to 3'' prime in this direction, the primer has been laid down from 5' prime to 3'' prime in this direction. At this point, the primase has fallen off, and now DNA polymerase 3 E. coli will come and now it will begin to add nucleotides to the three prime exposed end and DNA will now be added in the five prime to three prime direction. Okay so now the replication is complete and we see have um, our DNA 
and we have both strands have been replicated. We still have the primers on here because we haven't removed them yet. But now the question is, what if this DNA had been longer? Okay? So I'm just going to elongate our DNA. So what happens here? Well, if there were some DNA polymerase here, on this strand, no problem. We just keep elongating. And we have no problem there. But what about this thing? We have a problem here because what is the end of this one? It's a five prime end. And one of the things that we know about DNA polymerases is we only extend from the three prime end. We only extend growing the five prime to three prime direction. And so this strand cannot extend in this way. And so what would have to happen is RNA polymerase would come at some point in time, lay down a primer, and then DNA polymerase would come down and lay down another piece of DNA. Now, when this happens, as you can see, it took much longer to lay down the primer and then lay down a piece of DNA. And that's why this strand is lagging behind this strand. This is why this is known as the leading strand and this is known as the lagging strand. And we keep this in mind as we move to the replication fork. Sometimes it's harder to see on the replication fork. But on the replication fork, the DNA strand that is moving in the direction of the fork is always going to be the leading strand. And the one strand that is actually moving away from the fork is always going to be the lagging strand. Because that's going to be the one that is opening up and additionally putting down primers. Moving away from the fork is always going to be the lagging strand. The one moving in the direction of the fork is always going to be the leading strand. Okay, here is our replication fork that is now open. And as you can see, the helicase is bound to the lagging strand template. We have our single-stranded binding proteins. And we see a new enzyme here. This new enzyme is gyrase. Gyrase is a topoisomerase. And this topoisomerase is playing a very important role. It is easing the torsional strain that is on the helix. As the helix opens up, it creates a great deal of strain. And this is demonstrated on this rope. Cords here are representing the DNA helix. And we're going to be talking about the role of gyrase here, which is a topoisomerase. And remember, the initiation proteins will bind to open up a small gap. When helicase comes in, it starts to open up even more. But what happens is, is after a period of time, you can see that there develops some torsional strain here. And I can no longer keep pushing anymore. What gyrase does is gyrase will make a small cut in one of these strands. And the strand can actually unwind, releasing the strain on the DNA in front. The DNA will reattach and the strain is released. And that's why gyrase is always in front of the replication fork. The topoisomerase, which we talked about in our previous lectures in one E. coli chromosomes, the topoisomerase works by making small cuts in the chromosome and then resealing them. And that eases the strain as the fork continues to open up down. So now with this open fork, the most important enzyme that comes in is going to be the primase, which is the RNA polymerase. And we'll have a primase down here and here. And this is going to synthesize a small piece of RNA that is going to be complementary to the DNA. As we talked about before, the RNA primers will be approximately uh, 10 to 12 bases long. Obviously with this demonstration they're not going to be quite that long. So the primase has laid down the RNA primer and as you can see it's in a complementary fashion to the existing DNA. 
Once the primase has moved away, now the DNA polymerase will come in. And in this case, the workhorse for E. coli, the one that lays down the most DNA, is DNA polymerase 3. And so it will come in and it will start laying down the DNA at the 3' prime end, working in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So the DNA polymerase is still on and it's still laying down things, but as you can see, we've started running out of room. And so the fork is going to continue to open up and we are going to continue replication. All right, so our fork has unwound more, and as we can see, we have many more bases available for replication. DNA polymerase 3, as you can see, is still attached to the 3' prime end over here. And so replication on this end is not a problem, and replication will continue. But on this end, we have a problem, and this is the lagging strand, as we've already explained. And so on this end, RNA polymerase will need to come in to lay down the primer. All right, so now we see that the DNA polymerase has continued to add to this strand. Now, as you can see, the synthesis on this strand, the leading strand, has been continuous, and that's why the leading strand is also known as the continuous strand. On the lagging strand, the primase added the primer in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, and then DNA Paul 3 came in and started adding DNA nucleotides in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Since this was synthesized first, this fragment was synthesized first, and this fragment was synthesized second, this, the synthesis on this strand was actually discontinuous. And so the lagging strand synthesis is known as discontinuous synthesis. And we have two fragments on this strand. Each fragment, this fragment, and this fragment are known as Okasaki fragments. As you can see, we've run out of room again. And so once again, the fork will continue to unwind and we will continue with DNA synthesis. All right, once again, the replication fork has opened up, and as we can see, on the leading strand, the DNA Paul 3 is still attached, and so it will be able to continue the extension of replication. On the lagging strand, we once again have a 5' prime end, which we cannot extend to. Therefore, RNA polymerase will come in and lay down a primer once again. Okay, once again we can see that we've run out of room. And we could keep doing what we've been doing for, oh, 30, 40 days. But we're not going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do next is we are going to demonstrate what happens as E. coli has to now link our three Okasaki fragments together using two very important enzymes, DNA polymerase 1, which will remove our primers and then fill in DNA that is missing after the RNA polymer. RNA has been removed, and then DNA ligase, which will link the Okasaki fragments together. Okay, so we're now ready to remove the primers from the lagging strand, and in order to do this, we're going to need the help of DNA polymerase 1. Now, as with all of the DNA polymerase, they have the ability to add DNA to a 3' prime existing end. So the DNA polymerases will come and they will lay down starting to add to these three prime existing ends. But DNA polymerase one has an additional ability. It has the ability of an exonuclease. It has the ability to remove nucleotides from the five prime end. DNA polymerase three does not have this ability. And this is why DNA polymerase 1 is necessary. So while it is extending from this 3' prime end, it is removing these 5' prime 
it is removing the nucleotides from this five prime end. So it will remove all of the RNA nucleotides as it is laying down additional nucleotides to the three prime end. So it will remove the RNA and extend the DNA. So as we can see now, DNA Paul 1 has removed all of the primers. Now the one thing that Paul 1 can't do, it can extend by adding nucleotides to the, ex the existing 3 prime end, and it can remove the primers by using its exonuclease activity. But what it can't do is it can't link to the other DNA strand. It can't form that bond. And for that, to link up the two Okasaki fragments, we have another enzyme come in. And that enzyme is DNA ligase. And so ligase is going to sit down, and ligase is going to link our two fragments together. And there we are, the DNA replication fork. Not a fork you can use for dinner, but a fork that will help you pass the test. <laughs> So, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. So may your DNA replicate faithfully. <laughs> Boo bye.